Do re mi fa so la ti do. I'm a huge. What's going on, guys? I'm gonna start off by saying I'm a little self-conscious just because I spilled Diet Dr Pepper on my shirt right when I went to the bathroom, and I don't know if it's showing or not. But I want to be very forthright about that. Otherwise, it'd be in my head, and it wouldn't be a good video. So. If you see that there, it's Diet Dr. Pepper. Anyway, this morning I asked my Instagram, which by the way, if you don't follow me, you can do that either here or here or here, wherever Rico decides to put it. Rico's behind the camera, by the way. Follow me on Instagram because I put on my story, I would love to answer any and all questions surrounding personal training. So what Rico and I did was we collected the 50 most common questions people asked about personal training. And that's what we're gonna discuss today. <music> Do you ever not feel motivated to work out? Yes, absolutely. Doesn't matter if you're a personal trainer or not, you'll have some days where you're super motivated and other days where you're not. Everybody has those days. What are the qualities of a great coach? This is a tough one because there's a lot of qualities, but I think one of my favorite and most important ones is uh, embodied in one of my favorite quotes. My job as a coach is to show you where to look, but not tell you what to see. I wanna show you, give you all your options, teach you the most important principles, and you decide what works best for you. A good coach can help the client find what works best for them and teach them how to make it work on their own. What is the first thing you tell new personal training clients? So the very first thing I tell new inner circle members, new one-on-one -on -one clients, is you can't fuck this up. Because everybody thinks if they eat too many calories, if they go out for a night of drinking or whatever it is, they fucked it up. And the reality is you didn't as long as you get back on track. So the first thing I do is take that excuse away because as soon as you know you can't fuck it up, you can't fail. What is the hardest part of becoming a trainer? All right, this one's tough because there's anatomy and physiology, there's programming, there's nutrition, there's a lot. But I think psychology is the most important part and the psychology of a coach in which as a coach, you just wanna help everybody. You want everybody to succeed. And the hardest part of becoming a coach is understanding that you're not gonna be able to help everybody and you have to be okay with that. What was the hardest thing for you to learn when you became a personal trainer? So I think when I was younger, I had this idea of what my goals were because I was super into my training and super into my nutrition and I knew what I wanted. And I sort of projected that goal onto all of my clients. And it took a long time for me to realize that my goals as a lifter were not my clients' goals. And it's really important to remember that you need to listen to what they want so you can give them what they want, not what you want. Do you get tired of repeating yourself? Absolutely, 100%. And a lot of coaches are like, oh, I just say the same things over and over again. And that's why, if you look at what Rico and I do, we say the same things over and over again, but in different ways, with different styles of content, as a way of, number one, helping more people understand it and reach more people, but also because it's more fun to do things in a new way. Books to recommend for strength training, nutrition, and psychology. So I'm gonna put the links to each of these books in the description so you can just go directly there. I wanna be forthright with you. It'll be an Amazon affiliate link. So if you decide to purchase through there, I'll get a very small commission. If you decide that you don't wanna use that link, just Google search the name and you'll be able to buy it without giving me an affiliate commission. Uh, I would say for strength training, one of my personal favorites is Periodization Strength Training for Sports by Bampa, amazing book, especially on learning how to write good programs. For nutrition, I would say I'm Precision Nutrition Certified and I think their course manual, the book is tremendous. It's absolutely incredible. And from a psychology perspective, I would say without question, the single most impactful book I've read is Motivational Interviewing. So I'll put those in the description. One thing you would tell your younger self about training. I would without question say, hey, dude, Chill the fuck out. If you miss one day, two days, a week in the gym, you're not gonna ruin your progress, relax. Okay, this is a good question. If you could train any celebrity, who would it be? So, first and foremost, already coaching Gary Vaynerchuk. Full disclaimer, he's changed my life. Absolutely incredible, and if you wanna see how I got the job with Gary, put the link to that video in the description of this video but if I could train another celebrity, you know, it'd be it would have to be between The Rock or Kevin Hart. 
One of those two. What is the most annoying thing you wish people would just get already? The single most annoying thing I just want people to understand is that your weight will fluctuate up and down for reasons far outside of fat gain and fat loss. Period, end of story. And I did a whole video on this, it got a huge response. If the scale is affecting your emotions and you're not sure why it's fluctuating, the, vid the link to that video is in the description. I swear to God, it'll change your life forever. Please watch that video. If you could give only one tip about weight loss or fitness in general, what would it be? You need patience and you need grit. It's gonna be a long time before you see progress and you've gotta grit the f up and go and do it even and especially when you're not motivated. Some people are gonna be upset about this one, watch. What is one piece of bad advice you've heard from a good trainer? I think one of the worst pieces of advice is for coaches to tell their clients that the word diet is bad. Because when you create fear around a word, you create fear around the thing itself. And this is coming from the same coaches who are saying, don't demonize carbs, don't demonize foods. Foods aren't inherently good or bad. Same thing with words. Diet just means what you're eating. It isn't a bad word. So we need to help people create a positive association with it, or at least a neutral association with it, rather than demonizing it, because that's how bad relationships happen. Do you always eat healthy? Do you ever allow yourself cheat meals? I literally just posted a picture of myself eating a donut on Instagram, which Rico will put here. This is interesting. Do you trust coaches who aren't in shape? Now bear with me, this is super important, okay? Because let's first and foremost look at the big jack dude in the gym or the really lean, strong woman. Just because they are very lean and very fit does not mean that they're a great coach, nor does it mean that they really understand what's best for you. They clearly know what works for them in some sense, but that doesn't mean they're a great coach for the masses. On the other side of the coin, it works the same way. Just because a coach doesn't look like they lift or maybe they're not super strong or super shredded, it doesn't mean that they're not a good coach. They could be a very good, very understanding, very strategic, smart coach. All that being said, I do think that being able to walk the walk and not just talk the talk is very beneficial from the psychology perspective so you know what your clients are going through and so your clients will trust you more. Have you ever had a client throw up during a workout because of not eating? I had one client during one of my first ever training sessions as a coach throw up, not because they hadn't eaten, just because I put them through a really fucking tough workout. <laughs> Has not happened again. Do your clients ever lie? And what do you do if they are? Yes, they absolutely lie. Not all of them, but yeah, people lie. And usually not because out of any malintent or trying to deceive you, but they're embarrassed, especially if they haven't been following the program, right? So sometimes they'll lie about how well they've been following their nutrition. What I do or what I do not do is blame them or shame them. Be like, you're lying to me, you stupid client. No, you don't do that. I say, okay, listen, if there's one part of your nutrition that you think you could improve, what would it be and why? And that question allows them to open up without feeling judged. What are the pros and cons of being a personal trainer? Pro, it is the best feeling in the world to help people achieve their goals. Con is it is the worst feeling in the world if you can't help people achieve their goals. How many calories should I eat to lose fat? There are so many formulas and I don't know who is right. I'm just gonna get straight to the point. I filmed a complete video explaining exactly how to find how many calories you should eat to burn fat. Link is in the description. Have you ever wanted to fire a client? Yes. Is there anything you are obligated to do as a personal trainer that you wish you weren't? So in this moment, no, I'm in a very fortunate position in which I have my own business and I'm not obligated to do anything I don't wanna do. That being said, when I first started coaching and in commercial gyms, it really sucks, but a lot of times the managers will put pressure on the coaches to sell, 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 even at the expense of quality coaching. And that really sucks and that's why I got out of the commercial gym realm as early as I could because I hated that feeling. When you see someone with bad form in the gym, do you tell them and fix their technique? The way I look at it is this. If someone came up to you at the gym and said, hey, your form sucks, you'd probably be like, hey, fuck off, asshole. Let me do my own thing. 
That's what's gonna happen on the other end too. So for me, nine times out of 10, I never say anything unless it's massively dangerous to them and the people around them. That being said, if I see someone with bad technique, I'll introduce myself. I'll talk to them, I'll get to know them. Over the next three, four, five sessions, see them in the gym, I can give my advice without seeming like a fucking asshole. And then we can be on a friendly term and they'll take my advice rather than just being like, hey, your technique sucks. Let me teach you how to fix this. What is the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you in the gym? I guarantee you're not gonna expect this answer. Um, when I was in college, and I don't know how this happened, I don't know how it's physiologically possible, so don't ask, but I was bench pressing. Lay down on the bench, I was like three or four sets in, going for my last one, and for some reason, that God only knows, <laughs> mid bench press, I got a full on erection <laughs> in, the, in front of the entire college gym. The person spotting me saw it, all the people around saw it. It was just boing while I'm benching. And to this day, I have no idea how that happened, <laughs> but that is the most embarrassing thing that's happened to me in the gym. Actually, I wanna know what's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you? Tell me in the comments. Jay, I'm going on vacation for two weeks and I've been so good with my training, so good with my nutrition, I've made a ton of progress and I'm concerned about losing it all over vacation. What should I do? Number one, you are not gonna lose all of your progress. You didn't make all of your progress in two weeks. You're not gonna lose it all in two weeks. It takes time in either direction. Not to mention, what are you gonna think when you're 90 years old and you're looking back on your life? Are you gonna look back and say, you know what? I'm super glad that I didn't go on vacation because otherwise I would've lost all my progress. Or are you gonna look back and say, wow, I'm really glad I went on vacation and took a fucking chill pill so I could enjoy myself and not be so damn rigid all the time for my fitness when I was missing out on life. Jay, what is your favorite exercise to increase the deadlift aside from deadlifting? Sumo good mornings, bar none, favorite exercise for increasing your deadlift. If you want a video tutorial, link in the description teaching you exactly how to do them. I have terrible shoulder pain. What is one exercise I can do to help it? Number one, go to a physical therapist. I'm not gonna be able to fix it for you like this. That being said, I think the best exercise for basically everybody with shoulder issues, band pull-aparts. What is the best exercise for your glutes that's not hip thrusts? Personally, I would say Bulgarian split squats. I keep hearing squats are bad for my knees. Is there any truth to that? First and foremost, no, squats are not bad for your knees. Squats with shitty form are bad for your knees. So very basically, keep your heels on the ground. Don't let your heels come up. As long as your heels stay on the ground and you have no pain in your knees, you're good to go. My upper body strength has always been weaker than my lower body and I really wanna get my first chin up. Do you have any tips? First and foremost, I fucking love that goal. It's amazing. Second, I would say controlled eccentrics. So the lowering portion of the chin up, just slowly lowering down is, in my opinion, the best way to build up the strength in a full range of motion. Lastly, I have a full video linked in the description showing you exactly how to progress from zero chin-ups to your first one, so make sure you watch that. Where did he go? Is there coffee in the vent? <laughs> no. No fitness Q&A would be complete were it not for an intermittent fasting question. Jordan, is intermittent fasting the best way to lose fat? First and foremost, one of the earlier questions was, do you ever get tired of repeating yourself? I've said this over and over and over again. I have a full 45 minute free video course on intermittent fasting, link in the description. It will tell you literally everything you need to know about it. As for this question, is it the best way to lose fat? No, absolutely not. The only way to lose fat is to be in a calorie deficit, period, whether you're intermittent fasting or not. If intermittent fasting works for you, incredible, do it. If intermittent fasting doesn't work for you, fine, don't do it because as long as you're in a calorie deficit, you're gonna lose fat. I know black coffee is best, but will a splash of cream in my coffee ruin my progress? <laughs> no, 
I want to express my beliefs around this by bringing in Kenzie Morgans and asking the question back to you. So I've been trying to lose like 15 pounds and I haven't been tracking my calories, not consistently. And like the weekends I've been a little bit, like I haven't been fully on track, not as much as I could, but like during the week I've been almost, mm, not fully perfect, but like pretty good. I just feel like it's the cream in my coffee that's keeping me from losing the weight. Thoughts? You can put cream in your coffee. You're gonna be fine. Just make sure you're in a calorie deficit. Look elsewhere. Look, what are you doing on the weekends? How many calories are you eating? Are you in a calorie deficit? Legit calorie deficit, not just like, I think so, I was eyeballing it. Legit calorie deficit. If you're ending up like having three large coffees with a ton of cream in it and your splash is really like a tsunami, yeah, that might be an issue. But a little splash, a little couple tablespoons of cream is not the issue. Everyone says something different. I just wanna know, can you burn fat and build muscle at the same time? Gonna get straight to the point here. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Made a full video on it. Huge response, people absolutely loved it. Telling you the truth about whether or not you can burn fat and build muscle at the same time and how to do it as well. Link in the description. What are some healthy snacks that also curb your hunger? There's a lot of reasons for why you might be getting really hungry and I would take a look at your diet overall to see if you're actually getting enough vegetables in. But three of my favorite snacks that I like to pair together, watermelon, seltzer, sparkling water, and Greek yogurt. The watermelon has a ton of water and it's really filling very low calorie. The seltzer, the carbonation really fills you up and the Greek yogurt, very high in protein. It's a good combination. Which is the worst? Going to a packed gym at peak hours, someone screaming and grunting as loud as possible while they lift, or someone not re-racking their weights. Going to a packed gym at peak hours is the worst. What is the most common mistake personal trainers make? I think, and I made this mistake as well, personal trainers put way too much emphasis on making the perfect plan and not enough emphasis on making a sustainable plan. They make a plan that on paper is like, this is gonna be elite, you're gonna get the best results but the person can't follow it for more than two weeks. And the reality is if you can't sustain it, you're not gonna make progress. So personal trainers need to do a better job of making something that's less optimal on paper, but more sustainable long-term. What is the scariest thing you've seen happen to someone working out? Oof, I've seen several people literally bar over their fucking face doing a false grip with the bench press, which means their thumbs are like this, boom, and the bar just falls right out. I didn't see anyone land on their neck, thank God. I have seen several people land on their chest. They had to go to the hospital. It was uh, really scary. As far as I know, they've all been okay, but that's don't use a false grip when you bench press. All right, this one was interesting. There's a two-part answer. What is the most dangerous exercise? I would say for good exercises, snatches, because it's the most complex lift. It is requires the most technique, the most concentration, and you're putting that weight right up over your head. It's very complex and very dangerous. Not a bad exercise, I love it, very dangerous. Bad exercises, I'd probably say something along the lines of a single leg jumping, hopping, skipping on a fucking bouncing Bosu ball while you're holding your hands over your head. Anything where you're doing single leg on a wobbly surface is stupid, don't do it. Should personal trainers be allowed to look at their phone while they're coaching? It's a really good question because a lot of coaches do it. They're always like, yeah, two more. Two more reps, good. What? Good. I like letting things play out and not setting so many rules because if someone's coaching like that, they're not gonna have many clients for long, right? The best coaches who pay the most attention to their clients, they're gonna win. What is the best set and rep scheme? I get this question all the time and I'll say personally, my favorite is three sets of three. I call this the nectar of strength three sets of three really heavy reps. That being said, that's only for maximal strength and that's just my personal preference. I did a full video explaining the best set and rep schemes for strength, for muscle growth, and for endurance. The link is in the description. When would you not take on a client? Really good question. Uh, I don't work with figure competitors or bodybuilding competitors. I don't work with people who are prepping for a figure competition just because it, it's super anal. It's like really, really, really meticulous and I don't like doing that. 
Um, I won't take on people with uh, serious disordered eating habits. I would rather them go work with a therapist. In the onboarding process, if I find out that they are almost very stubborn in that they're like, well, this is what I do now, and this is what I want to keep doing. I'm like, for example, they're like, well, I'm already doing CrossFit four days a week, and I, I'm not going to stop it. I'm like, okay, Karen, probably not the best idea for me to write you another four day a week training program if you're going to be doing four fucking wads on top of it. So if someone isn't willing to change what they're already doing, but they're reaching out for help, then it's like, it's a waste of time. How long does it take to become a personal trainer? Well, on Instagram, you can just go edit your profile and just say, I'm a personal trainer now. Um, there's no definitive time frame for this. I mean, you could, anyone can go get a fucking certification in a, over a weekend and just like say they're a personal trainer. I think the question should be, how long does it take to really become a great coach? And again, there's no definitive time frame, but the more time you spend learning, the more time you spend practicing, the better. And the people who spend more time studying, the more time practicing, the more time researching, the more time, the more time, the more time, the better they're going to become and the more they're going to win. Chin-ups or pull-ups? It's a good question. So chin-ups are when your palm face your face. Pull-ups are when your palms face away from you. Personally, I prefer chin-ups. They're safer on your shoulder. You get a bigger range of motion. You get some bicep in there as well. So Johnny Bag of Donuts likes it. So overall, I prefer chin-ups. Pull-ups aren't bad, but nine times out of 10, I'll program chin-ups. What is your favorite fat loss meal? All right, so number one, we know to lose fat, you have to be in a calorie deficit, all right? That's number one, regardless of what you're eating. That being said, there's a Middle Eastern dish called shakshuka. It's a tomato base, put some eggs on top, a lot of spices, cilantro, and it's delicious. Super low calorie, higher protein, very filling. Look up the recipes online, it's amazing. Is it better to work out in the morning or at night? Whenever you want, it doesn't matter, just work out. Did you ever get in trouble for swearing at the gym? So if you've read my content for any meaningful period of time, I cuss like a sailor, I know. Um, overall, no, but there was one time at the first gym I worked at after I graduated college, and uh, I don't know who, if you're watching, I can see you. I don't know who it was, but someone told my boss, they were like, Jordan's got a mouth on him. And I was like, that's fucking weird, I almost never swear. <laughs> But yeah, it, I didn't even get in trouble because my boss didn't really care about it, but someone did tell on me. Is cardio better than strength training for fat loss? Uh, no, actually. If it's between the two, I would choose strength training over cardio. That being said, I think both are better than either one alone. I think doing some strength training three to four days a week, doing some cardio two to three days a week, that's optimal as long as your nutrition is keeping you in a calorie deficit. Why do you throw your hands up like a ninja before you deadlift? All right, so Rico will embed a video of me deadlifting for my competition days here, but basically it's a combination of two things. Number one is lifting OCD. It's something I've developed over years and years and years of thousands and thousands of reps. That's like, if you watch a baseball player as they're stepping up to the plate and they're doing whatever weird like rituals they do, it's the same thing. It's like a ritual I do before I lift that sort of gets me in the right mindset. That being said, if you watch me do broad jumps, and we have some videos that we can embed on here as well, you'll see I throw my arms up and then back and go. And a broad jump, the technique is actually, the hip extension is very similar to that of a deadlift. And I think that from doing that over and over and over again with my broad jump to improve my deadlift, it carried over. What is the best tasting protein powder? So. I am not sponsored by any protein powder company, so this is, I'm not getting paid for this. From the time I was in college, my absolute favorite protein powder based on taste and cost was Dimatize Elite XT Rich Chocolate. It's a mix of whey and casein. You can put it in water, tastes like chocolate milk, super low calorie, very high protein, fantastic. And I'm not sponsored by them at all. What is the most effective pre-workout? So first and foremost, we have to define effective, which probably just means it gives you a fuck ton of energy, right? That's what pre-workout is supposed to do. Personally, I just like coffee. Just a nice little caffeine buzz is more than enough to get me in the gym. I don't like to get too hyped up. I also wanna be very honest with you, I don't buy pre-workout. It's super expensive. I'm not willing to spend that amount of money on it. And um, I wish I could tell you honestly a good one to buy, but I don't know, because I'd never buy them, so I can't tell you that. But um, 
I just drink coffee. Who is the most interesting person you've ever coached? Well, that goes without saying, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, and again, in the description, I have a video of sort of how I got the job coaching him and everything, which is a really crazy story. Uh, how I moved from Tel Aviv to New York to coach him. But Gary is extraordinary, to say the least. He's changed my life in many, many ways. And he's also a freak of nature, especially mentally, just like a freak of nature, the strongest mentally I've ever seen of anybody. So uh, definitely the most interesting person I've ever coached. What is the most misunderstood component of nutrition by personal trainers? I'm gonna have to say insulin on this one because a lot of personal trainers fall into the trap of uh, carbs are bad for you because carbs spike your insulin. And insulin being a fat storage hormone, logically you would assume, oh, insulin spikes, you're not gonna be able to lose fat. So calorie deficit doesn't matter as long as insulin is low. It's a massively flawed way of thinking, not supported in the literature. What I love most is speaking with people who believe this and having a very uh, civil discussion on it with research and showing them not only just like empirical research, but also client case studies and examples to show them, listen, this person increased their carbs over time. This is what happened while they were in a calorie deficit. And when you see hundreds of real life examples of people losing fat in a calorie deficit, regardless of what they're eating, it's undeniable. It's, it's not insulin, it's the calories that really matter. How many days a week should you be working out? I'm gonna start by saying, doesn't matter as long as you're doing something and something could literally be 10 jumping jacks. Something could literally be a walk around your house. I would way rather you do something than nothing, okay? That being said, if we're looking at optimal, I think three to five times a week, and personally, three to four times a week is best. Five times a week, if you're already very committed, you have a good schedule, you're really trying to reach a higher level peak physique, but three to four times a week, for 98% of people is more than enough to lose fat, build strength, build muscle, feel better, be more confident, it's plenty. All right, so this is the last question, but before we get to it, if you made it this far, huge thank you. This is a long video of just random questions and I hope you enjoyed it and I sincerely appreciate you watching. Your support is everything to me, it's my oxygen, so thank you. And as my way of saying thank you, as I do a lot with these YouTube videos, if you comment below, and tell me what your favorite answer was throughout this video. I will pick three people to get a free month in the inner circle. So like the video, subscribe to the channel, and comment below telling me your favorite answer in this video, and I'll pick three random people to win a free month in the inner circle. What would you do if you weren't a personal trainer? And I've spoken about this a lot, but I would have without question been a history professor. I'm obsessed with history. I love history. And it sounds weird when I tell people this, but specifically the Holocaust has always intrigued me a lot. And I spent, I lived in Israel for years and I took a lot of Holocaust classes growing up and both in Hebrew school and in college. And uh, the Holocaust was always very interesting to me, not only just about the prisoners, but also really the prison guards, the people who were working there because it's super interesting to me that when you actually look in their lives, you read their journals, they were normal people. They had husbands and wives and kids. They would go on vacations. They would go to work in the morning and go home at night. Like, and in between doing these unthinkable acts of evil. And I've always been really into psychology and emotion and human behavior. So long roundabout answer saying history professor and probably most definitely specializing in the Holocaust. So thank you for watching. Sincerely appreciate you, love you. Talk to you soon.